joining us. My name is Hadley Gamble, and I'm the anchor and Middle East correspondent for CNBC News, based right over at Abu Dhabi Global Market. And I want to welcome you guys once again uh, to this very exciting Atlanta Council Forum, and we're very excited to be a part of it this year. One of the things, of course, that we want to do this year is kind of mix it up. Usually, we have a Davos-style format, and everyone sits on a stage, and we take questions at the end of the format. But what we'd love to do this year is to be a bit more interactive. So we're going to be speaking to these esteemed panelists, but we're also going to be tossing to you guys in this, the audience, and we want to hear from you. This is, of course, on the record, so I would suggest everybody try to keep those questions pretty, pretty short and very much to the point so that we can get all of them in. And now I would like to introduce our esteemed panel to be talking about the energy agenda for 2019. Joining us on stage right now, as you probably very well know, His Excellency Suhail Al-Masrui, the Minister of Energy for the UAE. We also have the Special Representative on Iran for the U.S. State Department, uh, Brian Hook. Lisa Davis, the CEO of Siemens Energy and also a member of the Managing Board. And our very good friend, Maji Jaffer, the CEO of Crescent Petroleum. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us. And it's very exciting for me as a follower of the oil markets and a reporter for CNBC to get to speak to the Minister of Energy so closely in one week. I spoke to him just about three days ago for his first interview of 2019, and I asked him about his tenure as OPEC president. I asked him, did you feel trumped by what we saw happening over the last year? My question today, though, is how do you plan to tackle the known unknowns coming from the Trump administration in 2019? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's, uh, we will continue doing what we have been doing successfully in the past two years, which is uh, watching and trying to achieve the market balance, trying to ensure that, uh, the, uh, that we have enough oil, but not too much oil in the market for the consumers. Uh, we will not target... Uh, as we always say, a price, we are targeting that balance. Whatever the price is going to be achieved by the, uh, by the market, when we reach that balance. I think uh, we have demonstrated that we can increase production and we can decrease production when needed. And I think that is a good testimony of how strong this alliance between OPEC and non-OPEC. So I'm optimistic that during 2019, we are on track to, uh, to achieve that balance rather in the first part of the, of the year rather than the later part. And Brian, I want to bring you in here as well because when we're talking about those known unknowns, one of the things that really threw potentially some of these OPEC countries, OPEC plus for a loop, were these extra waivers when it came to Iran last year. How do you see this playing out in 2019 and what do we really need to watch for? Let me first thank Fred Kemp and the Atlantic Council for hosting this event and for, uh, for the Emirates here. It's a pleasure to be back in the Emirates. Um, on, the, on the oil exceptions that we granted, uh, at the time when the president left the Iran deal in May, uh, oil was trading at about $74. And we had, I would say, a, a fairly tight oil market. And we were in the process of uh, talking about how we have a goal of getting all Iranian uh, uh, imports to zero. And we ended up taking off in that six-month period uh, from when the time the president left the deal in May until uh, our sanctions were then fully re reimposed in November. We had taken off about a million barrels of Iranian crude off the market. We did not want to lift the price of oil, and we were successful doing that. So when the president left the deal, it was trading at 74. When our sanctions went back into effect and we had taken off a million barrels of Iranian crude, oil was at 72. So we had very carefully calibrated 
the balancing of our national security goals and our economic interests. We did not, the president was very clear that he did not want to cause a spike uh, in oil. And so we granted uh, eight uh, oil exceptions, significant reduction exceptions. All of those countries demonstrated significant reductions in their purchases of Iranian crude that made them eligible for an exception. We are not looking to grant any waivers or exceptions to the import of Iranian crude. Uh, in the last cycle, we had to be very careful because as I said, we had a, uh, we had a fairly tight market. The United States increased production by 1.7 million barrels a day during that period. Our exports were at about a million. The Saudis were very helpful. Uh, Khaled El Fala did, did a terrific job increasing production to ensure a, a, a well-supplied oil market. Next year, we, uh, we foresee uh, a better picture. Uh, and then I think that allows us to accelerate our path to zero. And in terms of the waivers ending in May, what's your expectation today? of whether we could see those extended? Well, I can't preview that specifically. <laughs> uh, all I can say is that we, we believe that, a, uh, that certainly when we have a better supplied oil market, uh, then that puts us in a much better climate to accelerate the path to zero. And of course, one of the things that um, is always on the mind of every markets reporter is the price. And last year at Davos, I had a conversation with Majid, and we were talking about what the price expectation for this year or 2018 would be. And he said we'd see 80. What is your expectation today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as brave to, um, to forecast it for the year. I think what's, what's, what we have seen clearly in the last few months is a lot of volatility. And I expect uh, that will continue. Uh, if we look back on the... Uh, concerns, obviously China, what's happening with China, uh, trade deal, but also the economic situation. Uh, and then on the supply side, the growth that we've seen over the last year has been mainly US, Canada, Brazil to some extent, uh, and Iraq. But really, if you look back, uh, say back to 2012, 70% of the growth in supply has come from the US. So we're largely relying on U.S. unconventional supply. Uh, and in, in fact, the last three years, conventional oil hasn't played a role in supply growth. Demand's gone up by 4 million barrels a day. We're over 100 million barrels a day for the first time. Uh, and all of that in the last three years came from the U.S. So there is chronic underinvestment in conventional uh, oil and then on the gas side, uh, the growth in demand for gas, uh, the huge developing economies like China and India, recognizing it as a fuel of choice for power, not just for global climate change uh, policy, but for local air quality policy. That's a huge political driver now, with cities like Beijing and Delhi, uh, you know, and it's more than just a quality of life. They've had huge health challenges, even deaths as a result of air quality. So the switch from coal to gas, which economies like the US and, and the UK have already largely achieved, is going to be a big driver for gas demand growth, particularly in Asia. I'm not hearing a price from you there, though. I think, that, I think what we need to see in the upstream sector to encourage more investment on the conventional side is a price band probably between 70 and 90 dollars, 95 maybe. Um, I think north of 100 starts to become harmful for consumers, uh, but at the levels we're at now, we're, we're, we're still seeing underinvestment. Uh, probably this range of 60 to 80 is, is where we might be. Um, a lot depends on the kind of central bank of, of the OPEC plus deal continuing, which I expect it to. And I think it's uh, surprised a lot of the naysayers uh, over the last uh, year. And, and the Saudi-Russian partnership there obviously has been uh, key. Uh, the big unknown is all the concerns of global recession. Is it people just annoyed that interest rates are going up and their heady days in the stock market aren't going to continue? Or is it a real threat. And, and that's something I think that, that 
you know, oil markets are going to be watching closely over the coming weeks. And Lisa, I want to bring you in here on that, especially because as a company, how do you forward plan given all of these kinds of constraints in terms of your technology? Yeah, well, you know, obviously, uh, um, from a, for Siemens, uh, you know, we're, we're a technology company. We focus on innovation. And, and so our focus is trying to understand where the markets are going, where technology can benefit in terms of helping to create more efficiencies, more advances, more environmentally friendly uh, production and, and operation. So, so our planning is really, I think the, the challenge we have in our planning is being able to accommodate the complexity that we see in energy systems today. Uh, so we're very much focused, and you've heard a lot from the speakers that opened the sessions this morning about the importance of technology with respect to energy systems and the advances that have been made. Uh, we're, we're very much emphasizing uh, continuing to put technology into existing operations. So how do we continue, for example, in gas turbines and in energy systems to advance that technology to drive efficiency, uh, to reduce CO2 emissions, to make the operations more reliable and, and more, 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 more safe, safer. Uh, and then also, if you look at new technologies, there's a huge amount of effort going into even technologies beyond what you see in today's market. So as, as you look at energy systems today and they become much more complex, how do we leverage uh, digitalization? You've heard that spoken about this morning already to manage that complexity, put intelligence into the grids, be able to visualize the energy system in a bigger way through digital twins and such. But also what we're finding is as energy systems get more complex, uh, the need to integrate more across the different forms of energy, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be renewables, et cetera, how do you integrate and, and, and the ability now to convert one form of energy to another form of energy? So for example, electrical energy into thermal energy, so excess power into heat, or the ability to convert excess uh, electrical or energy electricity into hydrogen or into ammonia or into methanol, what we call gas or power to, power to X or power to, to different forms of energy. And this gives us more flexibility uh, and the ability then to accommodate even more complexity in those energy systems. So our focus is very much on how do we develop different technologies to manage the complexity. Your Excellency, right before we turn to the audience for a few questions, I want to ask you specifically about some of the challenges that you foresee in terms of those geopolitical and economic headwinds, because we heard on the stage about what we consider uh, the dangers in terms of supply and demand, what we're talking about about Chinese growth, worries, of course, about what we could or could not see coming out of Washington. Could you specifically tell us some of the headwinds that you foresee in this year? I think one is demand, and demand is... Uh is, is a result of the uh, either a good business and, and a good financial year or not. And the threat of the trade war or tension, I wouldn't call it war. I think I don't think it will go to a war because we cannot afford that. But I think that tension, the more unclarity on that tension, the more it's going to be, the, the more we will see fluctuation on what is the expected demand. Uh, the, uh, we, we don't need to see uh, volatility on the oil prices because if you see volatility, then you will, you will hurt demand. And what we want to, to achieve is less uh, volatility and hopefully with clarity on some of those issues like uh, grants or sanctions or not. The more, we, the, more the market understands the expectation, the more the market can plan for it. You cannot just turn the well or, 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 uh, or uh, a million barrel just overnight. It needs to be well planned. And I think the lack of understanding between the uh, policymakers in the geopolitics who, who are setting the geopolitics is leading to a higher volatility in the oil market. If we understand things, I can assure you we have spare capacities that we can use. Uh, and uh, so the trade tension between China and the U.S. Is, is, is one thing that we need to watch for. Uh, how much to expect from the shale oil, that's another thing that we need to understand and maybe work uh, with the uh, shale oil producers to understand. And we, uh, we pay them a visit uh, at the Sierra Week and we have that discussion, candid discussion with them. The, the idea is not to, to, to talk about the production or limit, just plan uh, plan of, of, of the production, then we can, we can adjust for, uh, 
for the uh, for making sure that the balance in the market is there, which will attract investors to continue investing here in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, I think I think those are those are the uh, the main major two uh, two elements. Are we going to see a slowdown in the in the financial world? Uh, is there is there true a uh, a uh, a recession coming and when and how can we plan for it? Uh, the, all, all of those uh, re major risks are, I think, not unique for the oil industry, but they are in, in they are generally concerns for all of the investors around the world. And you mentioned policymakers lacking understanding potentially about the markets and supply and demand. Were you referencing the U.S. president by any chance, or anyone specific? No, no, no. no I think I think uh, people are trying to trap us into this. But what we respect, uh, I think all of those major nations, industrial nations, they are the major economies, United States, China, India, uh, Russia. We listen to those presidents because they are talking on behalf of the consumers. And to us as, as a producing nations, it's important to understand what makes the consumers happy and try to do it for them because that will drive demand. We are not in the business of slowing down demand because we want to achieve a certain price. That is a very old policy that we throw it into the pen. We are now concerned about achieving the balance, incentivizing investors to continue investing in this important commodity and uh, some of those countries, the uh, United States is, is, is the world's largest producer of oil. So it's, it's, it's also part of their economy uh, to have a good incentivizing economics for those investors in the shale oil and in the others. So I think, I think it's, it's, uh, we are complementing each other, we're talking to each other, but we're not, we're not, uh, we're not enemies here. We're trying to do something that, that benefits us all. I want to turn now to the audience to take a couple of questions for our panelists. <clears throat> if you'll raise your hand, I have microphones that can come to you all around the room. And I have one right down front. <laughs> no microphone. <laughs> Halima doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, Brian, this is a question for you. I'm always asking you questions. But in terms of you know, the skepticism in the market, there has been some skepticism about the ability of the US government to actually enforce sanctions. There's been a lot of discussion about ghost ships turning off their tracking devices, you know, countries seeking to evade the sanctions. Can you talk about you know, the successes or the challenges you actually have enforcing this sanctions regime? Yeah, good question. Um, for Secretary Pompeo and the President, sanctions enforcement is one of our top priorities. In the prior administration, uh, they had granted about 20 uh, oil waivers over a period of three years. We have granted eight. Three of those eight have stopped importing Iranian crude. So we, we face a much different picture today than the Obama administration. We, um, I gave a speech uh, shortly after our sanctions were reimposed talking about the point you just made. Uh, at the time that I gave the remarks, we had about a dozen Iranian tankers that had turned off their transponder. And in the Obama administration, I think you had almost half of the tankers had turned off their transponders. Since 2004, it is international maritime law to ensure the safety of traffic that ships operate with, with, with their transponders. And so the Iranian regime, which is an outlaw regime, um, to certainly tries to evade sanctions. Uh, we have, I think, organized the interagency in a way to make sanctions enforcement a big priority. And we have had um, a fair amount of success with it. Uh, I think nations around the world know that the president is very serious about his campaign of maximum economic pressure. Uh, there were about, prior to when the president left the deal, you had about 20 uh, countries that were importing Iranian crude that today are not importing any Iranian crude. 
So when, when, when the President and the Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Defense make Iran the priority that it is, I think nations around the world understand that there is no benefit to them partnering with the Iranians to evade our sanctions. We will sanction any sanctionable activity. And we have already demonstrated that. Uh, Treasury has already done some sanctions since the time that we, we have reimposed ours. We know how Iran evades sanctions. We know the general channels they do it. And uh, we are working very closely uh, with our partners to try to close those loopholes. But then I've also met with a number of countries that have historically um, been open to cooperating with Iran, that it's a new day. Speaking of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your recent trip to Iraq and how you fared in terms of those kinds of conversations? Yeah, I've been on the Secretary's trip. We're on a nine-country tour, and um, we were in Baghdad and then also went up to Basra and had very good meetings there, specifically in terms of uh, my portfolio. Iraq has been importing um, electricity from Iran. We granted a 45-day waiver. Most of the oil waivers all run on a six-month clock, and that six-month clock is is by is by statute. It's by by, by congressional statute. Uh, we had we had discretion on the electricity piece, and so we granted a 45-day waiver initially, and that's because uh, we did not want to see electricity uh, outages or shortages in southern Iraq. Um, we did make very clear that we needed to see progress in the direction of um, diversification on energy and um, a better integration. Uh, we, we very much want Iran to stop interfering in Iraq. We want Iraq to um, enjoy uh, sovereignty. Um, and though that was the nature of, of a lot of the discussions in Baghdad. Well, one person sitting on this stage would have a pretty clear idea of how far those conversations really got. Majid, you've been working in Iraq for many years now. Give us your sense of how cooperative the new government is going to be to this kind of influence. So I, uh, I have no visibility on how those conversations uh, went. Uh, but the situation in Iraq, there's clearly a lot of gas resources in country. Uh, but what hasn't yet happened is a strategy to utilize them. So you have the strange situation where over a billion cubic feet per day being flared in the south and yet there are power stations, new-built gas-fired power stations, one by an affiliate of ours, uh, and further north in the country, in the center of the country, sitting idle, some of them on top of gas fields, uh, and, and utilizing imported Iranian gas uh, at quite a high price. Uh, so that, I think the Iraqi government recognizes that. Uh, electricity provision is the number one priority despite all the good news in Iraq in recent years, the defeating ISIS, uh, the elections, uh, the Kurdistan uh, post-referendum issue uh, remaining peaceful, the big issue is service delivery. The main reason the government didn't get re-elected or continue was last summer's demonstrations over electricity, and particularly in the south. So they've been talking with um, uh, Siemens, uh, GE, about national strategies, uh, but also looking immediately how to deliver more electricity for the coming summer. Uh, we have bid successfully on uh, three new blocks, two of them in the Diala area, uh, not far actually, 60 to 70 kilometers from our current production in the Kurdistan region, which is already 400 uh, million cubic feet per day. And we plan to double that in, in the coming years. But then with these uh, Diala blocks, we could hopefully add to the domestic gas production, particularly in the areas where there's a deficit of gas. And then in the south, you have Shell, who's been working on gathering uh, gas, associated gas. But as the oil production increases, of course, that associated gas production is also increasing. And there's huge investment requirements in the infrastructure. That's a major problem for a lot of countries. Lisa, I want to bring you in on that specifically and how Siemens is working to develop that, um, not just in Iraq, but regionally yeah. as well. Yeah, you know, one of, one of our, our biggest priorities as a company within our energy program is to make sure we work closely with countries to help them become sustainable, self-sustainable. And obviously that's, that's a big need within Iraq. 
Uh, we've been working for many years with the, with the government there, the old government, the new government, and have developed a very long-term view as to how we can assist the country with respect to creating their own, leveraging their own resources to ensure they can be sustainable and self-sufficient going forward. Uh, that includes, obviously, the ability to capture the gas, process the gas, be able to then convert that through power facilities into electricity, uh, then be able to connect that electricity to the grid and, and be able to support the grid for broader distribution throughout the country. And, and the focus being very much on the long term. So for, for us, it's about not only putting facilities in and the technology that's needed to create the systems that will give them energy and prosperity, uh, but it's also about being able to create jobs, being able to develop skills so that then the people of Iraq can operate those facilities, can maintain those facilities, and also to start contributing to the development of a private industry in Iraq. So, so we've been working very hard to bring this forward and, and are very optimistic about the opportunity and, and the potential to continue working on it. Your Excellency, when we talk about this uh, potential and, and the, the, sh the shortfalls or the pitfalls rather of um, a lack of development in a country like Venezuela, for example, which is now going to be the president of OPEC for the next year. How worried are you about these countries lagging behind and their ability, they can't just turn the taps back on immediately, their ability to help you going forward in terms of managing the market? I think uh, there was a reason for taking Iran and Venezuela out the, uh, the cut, outside the cut deal. Uh, those, uh, those countries, they have special circumstances. And I think it's obvious that in Venezuela, uh, they would need to, uh, to do lots of work on, on not only uh, stopping the decline, but also building up production. And uh, we are uh, talking to them. I think we have invited the minister a couple of times. Uh, he's a sincere person. He's trying uh, his best uh, to, uh, to, uh, to improve and uh, According to him, they have a plan. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's a difficult situation when, uh, and, and, and it's a complex, I think, political uh, as, well as, uh, as well as from a technical point of view, uh, it's not an easy, an easy uh, forecast to say, are they going to further decrease and for, 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 for how long or for how much? Uh, so I'm, I, I would be uh, hesitant to give you a figure. Are they going to continue? Are they going to stop or reverse? But we gave them, we took them out to allow them to, uh, to get, uh, to get to their action together and try, try to do something about it. If they manage to maintain, uh, I think that's a good news. Uh, then we can, uh, they, they, can, uh, they can be joined if there is another deal. But... Uh, no expectation that those two countries, and even Libya with them, who asked for, uh, for exemptions, they are going to increase their production. There is, uh, there is a more uh, likelihood of that production going down, like we mentioned, uh, that the, the sanctions are not going to be forever, and, 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 and they will be uh, probably tougher. So that's the expectation or the hearing we hear from the United States, that they are not forever. And then there is a limitation. So if that is the case, then that is going to hinder the, the, uh, the export and the production of Iran. And in Venezuela, they have another circumstances. They are also under sanction, but they have other issues as well. So those two countries, we decided to, 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 to take them out or, or not to impose uh, a production cut on them uh, for, for obvious reasons. One of the things I have to ask you, one of the most remarkable things over the last few years is seeing this relationship developed between Saudi Arabia and Russia, the UAE and Russia in terms of this OPEC plus. Are you confident that Venezuela as the president of OPEC will see the kind of success that you have in terms of continuing that dialogue and continuing that relationship, which has become so central to OPEC policy? I think there is a body called uh, the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee. And that body is going to continue uh, doing its work, it have uh, the the uh, we have two capable uh, ministers there, Minister Khaled Al Faleh and Minister Novak, and they've been instrumental in the success of 2018. I think they'll carry on uh, doing a good job, and they will help the president uh, to uh, 
to hopefully achieve, uh, achieve the decision. I think we have a question right here, Mr. Camp. I, I have a one-word question for all four of you. China. <laughs> uh, role in Iraq, Majid, role as a technolo technology uh, competitor, Siemens, role as a partner, UAE, role in Iran, in what you're trying to achieve with Iran uh, for Brian. You want to start? <clears throat> China was one of the countries that received an exception. Uh, China has significantly reduced its purchases uh, of Iranian crude, and um, that's a good thing. Um, I just say one little, a uh, little bit about the, the sort of the, the foreign policy behind uh, our, our oil waivers exceptions. 80% um, of Iran's revenues come from oil exports, and this is the world's number one state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, if we want to deny this regime the money that it needs for its nuclear program, its missile program, for its regional aggression, maritime aggression, cyber threats, uh, human rights abuses, the whole list, um, we need to go after the money. And on the energy side, we have been very successful, uh, and there are going to be much deeper reductions. Uh, of Iranian imports. As I said, our goal is to get to zero as fast as possible. <clears throat> On the banking side, uh, the SWIFT financial system disconnected um, all the banks that we designated uh, in early November. And Iran is now increasingly feeling uh, the economic isolation that our sanctions are imposing. We do want to deny the regime the revenue that it uses to fund uh, all of its malign activities. But we also, we know historically that Iran does not come back to the negotiating table without pressure. I think if, if talking nicely um, would have worked, um, if that works, we would have solved this a long time ago. So we are uh, very focused on the energy side because that is where Iran's economy is structured in a way where it's its greatest, greatest vulnerability. Uh, China has significantly reduced. We've been very pleased with that. For us, China is, as you mentioned, is a strategic partner. We have, uh, I think, last year have been a year of, uh, a year of change in terms of relationship, a year of uh, bringing the Chinese companies to, to our uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, now uh, you can see them uh, part of the operations, and we are very happy with that, with that relationship. China is one of the major off-takers of the United Arab Emirates. It's, it's, a, it's a historical customer, and we will keep that. And we're building infrastructure uh, in, in, in China to, to, to allow, to, to give them uh, some security of, of, of supply as, as, uh, as a reliable partner. At the same time, we are investing as well in China in different sectors. And, and especially in the technology sector, we think China is, uh, is going to take leaps in, uh, in telecommunication, uh, and, uh, and we are trying to, uh, to understand and be part of that success story. Uh, to us, uh, the United States will always remain a, uh, a partner and an ally, but at the same time, we are realizing the growth of China and I think, uh, like the uh, the American companies, they have uh, they have uh, started uh, going to China, having manufacturing in China, teaming up with the, and, and 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 contributing to these to this uh, to this uh, technology leap. United Arab Emirates is also aspiring to to play a key role uh, as an investor and also as a partner for China. So so to us. China is, or relationship with China is an opportunity, and it's something that, uh, that is going to benefit both us and them. So I, I would add uh, a bit the same in, in terms of comments. I mean, for, for Siemens, we've had a very strong relationship for China, with, with China for many, many years. Uh, today, we see them as a very strong technology partner, a very strong business partner. 
Uh, what we do see changing with respect to China is in the past we had much more partnership around you know, joint R&D, joint technology development, partnerships in terms of new business fields, new business models. Uh, today we see much more of a desire for independence with China and I think that's much more of a reflection of the, of the, the challenge with respect to the, the trade environment that's been emerging over the past several years. Uh, from, from technology, we see China also being very focused in many of the same areas that we are in Siemens around digitalization, around innovation, around how to better leverage automation in different uh, industries uh, to, not, you know, to be able to drive productivity gains and increase capacities and such. Uh, so, so we see China becoming much more aggressive in technology development and much more aggressive in driving independence with respect to technology. Uh, but a very strong business partner as well from a, from a Siemens perspective going forward. So I think for in terms of uh, energy markets overall, that's the, that's the one um, maybe most important driver over the medium term is what is really happening with the Chinese economy. There have been several indicators in the last uh, few weeks even that maybe the rate of growth is slowing down. Uh, having said that, uh, what we've seen, uh, for example, with demand for LNG, liquefied natural gas, growth over the past year has just exceeded all the uh, expectations. So it's going to remain a very important uh, growth market for, for energy. In terms of its role here in the region, and, and Fred asked about Iraq, I mean, extremely active. Uh, and I'm very glad that, that the conference this year, the, the forum this year, has a particular focus on, uh, on Asia uh, and China. And I know there's a session on, on the uh, uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. And, and in Iraq, we've seen very active uh, in the upstream, upstream companies, service companies, um, state and private sector, and a big capacity for financing also. And maybe more of an appetite for risk, I think, through you know, the ups and downs many countries in the region have had, and Iraq obviously was a central battlefield with the war on ISIS. Many of the Western majors left or, or reduced activity uh, in certain parts of the country. We didn't see that actually with the Chinese uh, companies. So it, I, I think they take a long-term view and, and there's, there's clearly a strategic driver uh, for them to be active in this region and in energy in particular. And following on to the China theme, we have a question right here. Noura Mansouri, a researcher at CAPSARC, the knowledge partner of this forum and a visiting scholar at MIT. My question is to you, Your Excellency um, um, Suhail al-Mazrouri. My question is on the uh, nuclear power plant, the Baraka plant. What are the prospects of nuclear cooperation in the GCC? Like, what are the expectations being the pioneer in the region? We had a very stimulating uh, closed session yesterday on nuclear power in the Middle East. And one of the ideas was to launch a, um, an initiative, a, a nuclear cooperation initiative and have an uh, independent regulatory body for the GCC. What are your ideas on that? Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, the, uh, the successful program that we are building here in, in the United Arab Emirates, the idea of it is to become a, uh, a relevant uh, benchmark for, for the region. So we, are, we will be very happy to, uh, to share information. And I think especially with Saudi Arabia, the, the uh, collaboration and the discussion we had from the ministerial level uh, to, the, uh, to the operational level uh, has, been, uh, has been great. We talked about it and we are ready, I think, for, uh, for any lesson learned on, on this program. At the same time, we are trying with our partners from Korea to build an R&D, uh, specific R&D center here in the, uh, here in the, uh, in the, in the Emirates and trying to develop uh, or, or answer uh, certain, uh, certain uh, questions and develop certain technologies related to the specific environments of, of, of nuclear and, and, and nuclear safety here in, in this part of the world. So uh, I am optimistic 
that uh, that co that more collaboration will be uh, will be happening uh, f uh, to uh, and, and that will make the program that Saudi Arabia want to do uh, shorter probably because they will they could capture all of the learnings that we have uh, we have developed here in the United Arab Emirates and uh, and um, myself and and my uh, my good friend Khalid Al Falih will always talk about about these things. And I think we will uh, we will be ready if needed to sign any uh, more of uh, a, a joint Saudi Arabia UAE uh, collaboration agreements, or or even to to the greater extent if other countries uh, want to uh, to tap into this this uh, this form of energy, it will be also available. The idea is safety uh, and and security. Is, is in the top of the uh, of our agenda. We are building, probably I can tell you with uh, with confidence, the safest plant on 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 Earth. Uh, it's the newest and it's the safest, uh, and uh, we we are committed to uh, to to make it uh, a, a worldwide benchmark with uh, with our partners. And Brian, I want to bring you in on this as well because I spoke about. This with Khaled Al Fala last year in the beginning of 2018. We were discussing um, this potential for Saudi Arabia to bypass the 123 agreement with the United States. Mm. Um, this raised a lot of fears on Capitol Hill about the future of the region and security. What's your outlook for how U.S. policy is going to adjust to these new realities, particularly with nuclear growing in the UAE and Saudi Arabia? Well, on the, um, in the Bush administration, we negotiated the 123 agreement, the gold standard with UAE, uh, which was, uh, I think, a big accomplishment in the, in the sort of the history of nonproliferation. Um, the Iran nuclear deal um, lifted the prohibition on Iran enriching, and we thought that was a mistake. Uh, if you look at when Secretary Pompeo's speech in May after the president left the deal, he laid out 12 uh, requirements uh, for Iran to start behaving like a normal country. And I think number one or number two on the list was no enrichment. And we think it's very important to restore that standard. Uh, we can't allow Iran, I don't think Iran has earned the trust of the international community to have uh, restrictions on its nuclear program lifted. Uh, they, have, they have a long game of playing cat and mouse with the international community about the military dimensions of its nuclear program. Uh, this has been a very volatile region, and it's very important that we not uh, set off an arms race here. Uh, I know that proponents of the deal, uh, of the Iran deal, made the case that this, you know, it is a nonproliferation deal. Um, it's temporary. These restrictions expire. And we also think that the gains were not significant. And so it's important, I think we're in this moment on the national security side, we think UAE sets a, a perfect example for the region on, on the nuclear side. And Iran sets the worst example. And recently you had um, the Israelis uh, liberate from Iran about a half a ton of materials in, in, in Iran's nuclear archive, which was kept under armed guard in the heart of Tehran, which says a lot about Iran's ambitions. Uh, I've studied the history of countries that have decided to denuclearize. And one of the uh, common denominators is that they surrender their atomic archive. There's no need to retain a half a ton of materials on how to, how to build a nuclear weapon and the capability to deliver it if you really are running a peaceful nuclear program. And we have no evidence to suggest that Iran has um, come clean on the past military dimensions of its nuclear program. Uh, that should have been a condition of the last deal, but it wasn't. So we're looking to get to a new and better deal uh, with the Iranians, uh, with the regime, and that will include a nuclear component, um, but it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to include uh, all of the threats that Iran presents to regional peace and security, and the nuclear piece is the most significant. Question in the audience here? Hi, uh, David Friedman from Argus, which is a price uh, reporting agency for physical commodities. Um, question for Brian. Uh, I was wondering if you'd give some clarity on refined product exports from Iran and how they've been impacted by sanctions thus far. 
Um, our, our sanctions apply to um, the export of, of crude oil and condensate. And so um, we have not made an exception for condensate uh, as was done in the past. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's what your question is. Uh, Refined products. For your oil. Um, it's, uh, our sanctions have just been, been just around the, uh, uh, have been around just the oil and the, um, uh, the, the, the condensate. And so I don't have much to add beyond that. Etna. Back right here there. in the middle. Back there. Back there. Thank you so much. Um, Ethna Trainer here. A question maybe to Brian and Majid. I think I'd appreciate you coming in and any of you on this. You seem to indicate, Brian, that every move the president makes is a very strategic one and with great reasoning behind it. But the market and the media, I know the impressions of the media, seem to take it very differently. And I mean, you know, they're pretty bright people. The market has been around for a while. But the reaction to the tweets from the president, you know, have been in some way thinking he's playing games, whereby you're saying this is very strategic in terms of what he's doing. How can the market and the media get this so wrong? And how can the markets be in mm. such a flux just because? And I ask that probably a bit selfish because I am moderating a session tonight on the impact of um, the tweets coming from the president, particularly mm. in the oil sector. But indeed, this is right across the board. Thank you. Well, in the case of Iran, and I'm the Iran envoy, so I can only speak to that, but um, uh, it has been very strategic. And in terms of the analysts that you, that you mentioned, I would just point out that when the president left the deal in May, analysts were predicting that we would only take off 300,000 barrels. We took off around a million uh, in, in, within a few months. That was preemptive compliance with our sanctions regime. And you've had very consistent messaging from the president on the threats that Iran presents. When he uh, ran for president, he made it very clear that he thought the Iran deal was a bad deal. He thought that we gave up too much in return for too little, that, uh, that it wasn't an equitable uh, trade. And so uh, I spent about six months working with the, uh, the Brits, the French, and the Germans trying to fix the deficiencies of the deal, and that was around, it has a weak inspections regime, it has uh, the, the restrictions on the nuclear program lift, um, and there's no mention of ICBMs. And any country that wants to become uh, a nuclear power always needs the means to deliver them. And you always need to partner the nuclear, uh, the, the nuclear bomb with the means of delivery. And so the, the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal is silent on ICBMs. In fact, I think the Iran deal contributed, is contributing to, uh, to missile proliferation. We, we know it is. So going back to your question, I think you've seen a very consistent approach on this. When he was running, he said it's a bad deal. We then addressed, we, we highlighted what the deficiencies are. Uh, we tried to fix them. We weren't able to come to agreement with the E3. I think we came very close. We, we largely had agreement around inspections and ICBM, but we ended up having disagreements that we couldn't bridge about the sunset clauses. And so then the president left the deal. He made very clear that sanctions enforcement is going to be a big priority, and it has been. Uh, we do want to get to a new and better deal, but in that process, we are denying the Iranian regime billions and billions of dollars, and they're facing a liquidity crisis. The real is down 75%. Inflation is up, estimates around 40. Uh, we're having a very uh, significant impact on the Iranian economy, and we're just getting started. So I would say that we've been very consistent and very focused throughout this. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up in just a moment. But Sorry, Ajit I had to know. There's a gentleman yeah, there who actually ah. raised his hand first, but maybe with the lighting you couldn't see him. One more then. So. Very energetically. Thank you very much for the distinguished panelist. Uh, slightly shifting from the geopolitics, this is Walid al-Somali from Saudi Aramco. Uh, R&D uh, investments uh, in the arena of uh, energy um, is an extremely critical factor for uh, this region for efficiencies in the energy domain. Uh, latest European Union uh, statistics, $2 trillion were spent 2018 by corporate in R&D. So my question is for the distinguished panelists. Two brief questions. One, what it takes for multinational corporations operating in the energy arena 
to increase its investments in R&D technology developments here in the region. The other question is about technology-based entrepreneurship. Um, the whole region is putting a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurship and embedding them, uh, entrepreneurs, SMEs, startups, in the supply chain of energy. What can uh, uh, the energy industry, uh, how, uh, what strategies that can be considered in embedding entrepreneurship in its supply chain? Thank you. I can do that. So um, here in our region, I think clearly we're punching below our weight. We have half the world's oil and gas uh, reserves, or probably more, uh, but what, that's what's proven. Less than a third of its production, less than a sixth of, of gas production. Uh, and we've seen over recent years that other parts of the world, um, in North America in particular, have seen much more rapid growth. Now, we've had geopolitical issues, as you mentioned, many countries, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Sudan, uh, and that, that clearly affects uh, the oil uh, and gas development, but there is underinvestment. Uh, and it's great to see uh, what Dr. Sultan mentioned in terms of ADNOC looking at both cost efficiencies and new models for partnering with the private sector, because clearly the public sector can't be relied upon alone to take the burden of the investment because there are, there are national budget needs in all countries uh, and they are growing with populations which are growing. So how to encourage the private sector, and you mentioned multinationals, absolutely multinationals, but first our own uh, regional private sector, uh, and I say that as a member uh, uh, of it, uh, can play I think a bigger role in all parts of the value chain. In terms of R&D, it's very important, but it starts with the universities. We need universities with the right departments, science, technology, and uh, more on the oil and gas side, because even the multinationals, when they come to make such R&D investments, they usually look to an institution of higher learning that has that uh, capability. And I know Saudi Arabia has been a leader with many top universities in that field. Maybe I just make, make a quick comment to your question on uh, investment in R&D. Uh, we do see, from a, from a company perspective, the need to invest much more in R&D. Uh, and we see this, this region being a, a prime place to do that. Um, and, but the investment is in a bit of a different twist in R&D. It's really more around digitalization. It's really more about how do we bring innovation into creating new applications that allow us to run traditional systems in a different way. So how can we bring innovation into supply chain from a digital perspective, new tools that allow us to optimize, new tools that allow us to include artificial intelligence, et cetera. And we've recently announced here a, an investment of 500 million where we will start to develop and have already opened what we call application centers, where we're bringing together software engineers, partnering with local universities, local institutions to develop some of these applications that can be used to, to, to allow traditional parts of our industry to become more efficient, more innovative, more creative, more productive. And that to me is where we really need to invest more R&D going forward. From the supply and demand, I'd like also to add, from the, uh, sorry, from the, uh, the uh, 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 supply chain, and how do we allow the SMEs into the supply chain and have an allocation for them. I would like to commend the, uh, the ICV program or the in-country value program that uh, ADNOC have started. The target is around 40% local content and we are, we, uh, we are integrating uh, the, uh, the local manufacturers on, on the basis of proper audit of their contribution to the in-country value with a special uh, with a special emphasis on the SMEs. So the promotion of SMEs, their contribution to the, uh, to the, to the supply chain, to, to the supply chain is something that, that we target in the future. We're not there yet, but I think there is a good plan for us as an economy, as an industry to, to reach uh, where we are supposed to be in the near future. In terms of setting the, ag the agenda for 2019, I'm afraid we're actually going to have to leave it there. And we're running a little bit of overtime, but I'm going to ask the panelists to please stay for a few minutes and do a photo op. 
Um, but thank you guys once again. Talking about um, the need more, more clarity when it comes to what's happening with China's growth, the fact that more technology and investment is needed, certainly with regards to Iran, the question about what's going to happen next in that